Welcome everybody to the Shop Notes podcast. It's episode 20. We've made it this far. On today's broadcast, I'm your host, Phil Huber, joined by Logan Whitmer and John Doyle. Today, we're going to be talking about justifying tool purchases as much to ourselves as to others, as well as what's going on in the workshop. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. From furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs, and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com. All right. So oftentimes we'll have topics for the podcast. Sometimes we won't, and probably most listeners can tell the difference. So today, you, the topic justifying t- tool purchases, uh, that one's on you, Logan, so you get to start. <laughs> okay, so I, I was thinking about this uh, because I find myself in this weird balancing act, okay? Uh, everybody that listens regularly knows that I like to buy and sell and flip tools, okay? It's kind of how I fund some of my purchases. Um, and for the longest time, I was telling myself I'm not a tool collector, Okay, so uh, I'll get in these weird, I guess the underlying thing here is I'll get in these weird funks where it's like, God, that'd be really nice to have. Or, you know what, that is a really cool vintage plane. I want it. Then I'll buy it, and then I will get to a point where I have so much stuff that I just purge stuff out. And then I have this real, I get on this bandwagon of minimalist stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I get, I get in these weird cycles. Um now, I'll tell you where this all stemmed from. So today, uh, over lunch, I ran out to the hardware store, put my mask on, because you must do that in Menards now, uh, where we're at. And I picked up um, a couple duplicate tools. Um, and these are not necessarily woodworking tools. These are um, mechanics tools. So I bought a, an additional set of 3 8 inch drive ratchets, some okay. crescent wrenches, a cheap set of screwdrivers, um, and a handful of other small things. Now, this is all stuff that I have, and I have multiples of. Um, However, I have a set of each of those that lives in my shop downstairs. I have a set that lives in my garage, so when I'm doing car work or engine work or whatever. This set was for me to throw in, like, my to-go bag to keep with the sawmill. Okay, so last week we talked about me building the sawmill, put it together, um, you sure. know, getting ready to get it running and stuff. I want to just have a basic set of tools I can bring with me. Okay, and I could not help but feel a little weird buying these, and they weren't terribly expensive. Um, so I, I bought a couple of them at Menards. I did buy some of them at Harbor Freight because honestly, I love the Harbor Freight hand tools. They're inexpensive in their lifetime warranty, right? So my overall tool bag that I put together to bring with the sawmill was like 80 bucks. It was, uh, it wasn't, um, you know, hundreds of dollars by any means, but it was $80. I probably did not need to spend because I have it, but I'm thinking in my head, maybe this is me rationalizing it to myself (laughs) that by me having this in a tool bag, I can just keep it under the saw cover with the, with the mill, so it's always there. I always okay. have, because I know what would happen, and I would end up bringing a set of sockets with me to wherever I'm going to mill, just so I have them, just in case, because, you know, you you always want to have a set with you, um, and then i get home, and then I would need one. And I'd be like, where's that? Son of a buck, it's down at the end of the driveway with the sawmill. I have to go out and get it. So I guess... When do you guys feel a tool purchase is justified, whether it is a duplicate or not? Is it if it makes it life your life easier? Is it um, a, a tool for a specific purpose? Or do you guys find yourself just paring down to a minimalist type set and trying to go there? Because I feel like we all we all like tools, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, right. It's always fun to buy tools, but. I get to a point where it's like, I have so many of, I have so many, you know, pliers. It's like, I never need to buy another set of pliers. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, Two things here. I feel like this topic 
you came up with because you need to ra rationalize these purchases to your wife and you need help coming up with an argument? He doesn't know no, and she's sitting no. on okay. the table in there. So shh. Okay. And she doesn't she doesn't <laughs> listen to the podcast. Oh, no, so. she doesn't. <laughs> and when you said you have a tool to go bag, I'm picturing like you have a bag that you like like if you need to disappear suddenly, you have this tool bag of tools that you just bring with you. Like it's my bug out I'm bag. Just, right. Yeah, your bug out bag. So no, I think yeah, you make a good argument as far as like um like general purpose tools like sockets and screwdrivers and that kind of thing. It's kind of nice to have those at your different stations, whether you have a tool bag in your car or truck and one in your garage and one in your shop. Those, I mean, those kind of tools are relatively inexpensive and they're nice not to, you know, go searching for all the time. So that's, I think that's a good idea. And then maybe, um, if something specialized, you know, has a di like a little bit different, you know, specialization. I think it's nice to have another tool um, that's kind of similar. And uh, and then I guess just if you turn into a collector like Logan, then maybe you no start I, start hoarding. I, but I I, I kind of agree no, with what you said. But I, uh, it's, I I can't I I can't say that. I mean, honestly, like okay, I love I love boutique tool makers. You know, I've said that in the past. I love them. I I I just like I like supporting those those small companies that make beautiful tools and make them well. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I, I so tried to not become a collector. I'm, as much as I would love to, I just, having that much clutter drives me nuts. So I, I couldn't right. do that. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny because now, you know, as you were saying this, Johnny, you're saying, you know, having a set of tool at each station uh, made me think of, so I've watched, um, you know, we're all in quarantine. I've watched a lot of YouTube lately. And one of the guys that I really like to watch um, just for his um, uh, uniqueness and the, the variety of stuff he does is Adam Savage, um, formerly oh, of okay. Mythbusters. Now he runs, mm -hmm. uh, he has a YouTube channel called uh, Tested. Okay. And just yesterday he released a um, video on YouTube um, that was uh, titled, you know, my Adam's favorite things. And he does these segments where it's Adam's favorite things and just he highlights one tool or one item in his shop that's his favorite. And the one yesterday he was talking about, and I promise this is relevant to what you said, John, is he was talking about these um, these sets of Allen wrenches uh, from a company called uh, Bond House, I think, B-O-N-D-H-U-S. Um, they're Allen wrenches that are like super, super heavy duty and beefy. And he was talking about how this was his extravagant purchase and it was kind of his unnecessary purchase because he bought a set of these allen wrenches for each one of his machines so he's like i have one at my oh. metal lathe, i have one at my mill i have one at my drill press i have one at my table mm -hmm. saw and he has like and, and they're i mean they're expensive for allen wrenches i think the set of allen wrenches is like 60 bucks for the imperial version 60 bucks for the the metric version so but he has one of each set at each station um so and he said, he's like, you know, this was my, this was my um, TV money purchase when I was getting TV money. That was his, <laughs> his kind of mm -hmm. purchase for himself, which by the way, Phil, aren't we supposed to get that? Sure. Yeah. 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 You didn't uh, get, you didn't get yours? I didn't get no. mine. Oh, that's uh, weird. But I guess in my opinion, I mean, there has to be some sort of give and take, right? Like the convenience of having that tool there. Right. You have to yeah. weigh that, right? Phil, don't you think? Oh yeah, I think so. Cause you know, I, I definitely bounce back and forth between feeling minimal in the tools that I have a, just because my workshop is pretty small for where it is. Uh, and B, I just don't like more and more just don't like having a lot of stuff cluttering cause it just is, I have a hard enough time keeping stuff clean as it is and organized. So I'm going to, uh, give myself a head start on things. And I did that, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago was realizing like, I have 9,000 screwdrivers. Like what the heck, you know? Yeah. So, but what I ended up doing is, so I got rid of the ones that are all chewed up, mm -hmm. even though you still hold on to them, like dull drill bits, just put them back mm -hmm. in the drawer. They'll be sharper next time. Yeah. But what I did is I created little uh, plastic totes. So I have a plumbing tote 
yep. and uh, electrical work tote. And so I have some duplicates that live in there, but then every time I need to do one of those jobs, I know that I have the tools for it without having mm -hmm. to go on a seek and destroy mission. Mm -hmm. um, but then like little things uh, along the same lines is I'll have multiples of not whole sets of Allen wrenches, but like your bandsaw has like two or three Allen wrenches. Yeah. So I'll have extras of those and I'll have them at the bandsaw, you know, or uh, for router bits. There's usually a couple of Allen wrenches needed to pull bearings off of or, you know, attach a jig or something like that. So I'll keep mm -hmm. a couple of extras with that. But So I'll do it that way. But then, mm -hmm. like, in my shop, like, not too far away from me is what I have my, call my car care cart, where I just keep most of my mechanics tools. But then I also have in my tool chest here, I have a little drawer of a small set of wrenches and a crescent wrench just to keep stuff for machine maintenance or, you know, when you're putting together some projects, you just have lags that need to go in or bolts that need to get attached with hardware or something like that. So I definitely have multiples of those. It's when you start to get into the like, and I, <laughs> so this is a place where I've changed then is I was always, uh, I only need one router. That's all you need. <laughs> just one router. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it takes a little bit to put it in between the router table and for handheld operations. And, but that's all you need. It's not that big a deal. You don't need to go the full Abrams and have like one router for every bit and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we've used those little palm routers on the TV show and in the magazine so much that it's like, I could really use another router. So now yeah. I'm one of those two router guys, but, you know. Hey, no judgments here. You're in a safe place. Right, right. <laughs> but, but I'm also using them too, you know. Yeah. And I got into hand planes, and I have a bunch of hand planes, and I've made some. And I think I end up getting too much of an attachment to some of them sentimentally because I have some ones that I made that work okay, like I made one for a shooting board, but I have a hard time getting it dialed in. Mm -hmm. But I made it and I have a hawk blade invested in it. And it's like, do I really want to keep this? But yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and see, that's where some of this, uh, I mean, also stems from. And and this is something I've, I've always, I feel like I'm in an AA meeting or something right now. It's like, I've always struggled with this my entire woodworking career. Um, but it's like I, I see these guys that have or that want to have a full set of Stanley planes, right? For sizes sure. one to eight. And, yep. and they might have two or three sets. And to me, it's always been like, well, I, I don't feel like I, personally in my shop, I don't need more than one jointer. Right. I don't need more than one smoothing plane. Uh, and I don't need more than one jack plane. So, you know, a number of years ago, about the same time I started at Woodsmith, magazine i uh, i sold all my stanleys and that's how i funded my lee nielsen's and i bought i think i bought three or four lee nielsen's i bought the jointer i bought the low angle jack a smoother and a block plane and a scrub plane and those are really the only five bench planes i use anymore and yeah there are some instances where i think a number five would be really nice to have like a standard number five my, my low angle jack is is number five size but it's low angle but to my, you know, as I'm justifying some of these other tool purchases, I talk myself out of some of these other ones because I'm like, is that number five really that much different than my 62? It probably isn't in all practicality. You know, right. yeah, the blade angle is a little bit different, and I think you can take a bigger shaving off with it than you can the 62. But it doesn't really matter that much. And to me, it's more valuable, I guess, to have that, I don't want to say that shelf space because I don't have the shelf space, but it's more valuable to have less clutter, less hand planes in my shop. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just feel like, to me, it puts me in a better zen state walking into my shop and seeing, I don't want to say minimalist because I still have a lot of crap in my shop, but right. it, it's not where, it's not overwhelming, I guess. Yeah. 
and I guess that's where I feel okay okay about putting this toolkit together uh, mm-hmm. today for the for the sawmill because it's like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that with the sawmill it lives there it stays there. Um, so I guess I'm looking for affirmation. I, that's okay, mm-hmm. right, guys? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's not but like y- you know where this is going though. Is <laughs> it's like it starts with the the like bug out bag for the sawmill <laughs> and then you're gonna have it out there and it's like yeah it's under the cover but you know what i really need is like just a roof over this sawmill just so that i have a place just to keep the rain yep. and the snow and the leaves and crap from and then it'll be like what i really need is like this enclosed on like three sides just because yeah. of wind and mm-hmm. and then like doors on it and mm-hmm. i mean uh, air conditioner would be really nice right mm-hmm. and then i mean you'd hate I mean, you spent the money on it and you yeah. have to think like i'm not going out there in november and december <laughs> if it's freaking cold but uh, if i had like a little mini split out there then i would be sawing wood like all day long yeah mm-hmm. exactly well and you know some of this is i mean it comes it goes back to i i got to a point in my life right where this was kind of an epiphany for me when i realized a lot of what my parents and grandparents told me was true. And it was like, oh, crap, they were right. And I'm sure you guys <laughs> had the same things mm-hmm. happen. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, my grandpa's favorite saying was, in one hand and then wish in the other and see which one shows up first or fills up <laughs> first, right? Yeah. So, you know, I yeah. guess there's, with some of these tool purchases, um, it, it, the same way with, I, I have a couple of guys that I sell tools to all the time like i've sold them seven or eight number sevens like i don't know what they're doing with them <laughs> unless they're unless they're truly just collecting them and putting them on their shelves which mm. i know people do that right and hey more yeah. power to them for appreciating the tools and and whatever and giving me money uh but i guess you know i guess to me doubling up on tool purchases the the convenience of it has to outweigh the cost associated with it right like i don't ever foresee myself in my own personal shop we last week we talked about our production or our our magazine shop how we have three table saws i'll never have two table saws in my shop even if i have room for two table saws Mm -hmm. i never have a reason to have two table saws yeah you know just because to me unless one's given to me for free which would hey that'd be great um (laughs) But the convenience of having a second table saw in a shop doesn't do anything for me. Mm-hmm. And I know it's kind of apples and oranges comparing a set of sockets and screwdrivers, you know, versus a table saw. But I, just thinking about all these old timers that you walk into their shop and they have eight or nine, you know, vintage Craftsman mechanics toolboxes and every drawer has ratchets and sockets and screwdrivers and allen wrenches in it it's just like oh that just gives me it gives me a heart palpitations like i'm like Mm -hmm. i don't want to i don't want to have that (laughs) Mm -hmm. but each one of the sets is missing the half inch socket (laughs) the half inch and the 10 meter yeah 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 oh yeah but you know okay i guess if my wife finds out about my small tool purchase I will tell her that Phil and John said it is okay. okay. All right. That's and fair. And we will totally deny it. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, John, have you made it, have you doubled up on a tool purchase like recently? Or have you ever, have you uh-huh. bought one, I guess, that you thought, I don't need this, but man, I want it? Um, you could say that about my carts. <laughs> <laughs> I have like five carts, shop carts. So. Those more just bought at auction out of spite than really out of need or want or anything. So, but yeah, I don't really have a lot of, can't think of a lot of doubled up tools. I'm more of a minimalist, like like you guys say, that it's just like the space is more valuable than having a lot of tools, I guess, and not being overwhelmed. So. You know, on a related note, I've given myself or learned to give myself a lot more grace over time because my personality is one where I'd like to buy something, 
probably over agonize the decision, making sure that it was the exact right purchase. Mm -hmm. And then that is going to stay with me forever. Yeah. Whereas I've realized now that, um, like the tools and, you know, I've done it with jigs too, where it's like, they seem interesting. You try it for a little while, you know, maybe you use it, maybe you don't, and then let it go. You know, like, mm -hmm. I think one of the best things that I've realized and had the opportunity for, so I get that, that we have that luxury is the free table at work, <laughs> you know, where it's like, you know, I've, you know, I got a set of water stones and they worked really well, but um, I almost had one crack on me because I didn't have it protected from freezing, you know, and I'm like, I mm -hmm. just can't do this anymore. So I bought water, I get bought oil stones instead, but then it's like, you got this invested in water stones. So what are you going to do with it? You know? So I was able to put them out on the free table, some stuff I've sold and, you know, just to realize mm -hmm. like, I'm not the same woodworker that I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So I might have doubles of things and then I'll kind of go in, you know, like buy a bunch of tools and then get rid of a bunch of tools. And then you kind mm -hmm. of slowly ramp up and then you dip, you know, get yeah. back down. And it's like, it's not that big a deal. It's just, you know, they're tools, they're meant to be used. And if you, hopefully you can get to the place where you realize that if you're not using them, just, move them along. There's somebody else that might need it or, yeah, you know, be able to help out other woodworkers or something like that. Yeah. And that's exactly where, where, what I do is I'll, I'll end up with a bunch of tools, sell a bunch. Then I'll be like, all right, I'm in a happy place with the number of tools I have. I have everything I need and want in my shop. Um, then somehow I end up with a bunch more. It's, it's weird. It's the weirdest thing you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not weird at all. I mean, I see mm -hmm. that with our, in my home where it's just like, like, where did all of this junk come from? You know, mm -hmm. it's just, you put it in the room of requirement and it multiplies. And... <laughs> <laughs> all right. What are you guys working on? Well, I am continuing my uh, tree house build. It is going to be a, maybe a month long process, hopefully, but it's, it's fun, though, because it's like each step, each stage, like the kids are just so impressed. They're like, whoa, another board, Dad, this is awesome. <laughs> and they're just like swinging on, you know, the structure like monkey bars and stuff. And it's like, can I just stop here and like you just enjoy this for a while? And but, you know, it's been it's been fun and the kids are enjoying it and getting outside. And, you know, they can't go out to playgrounds right now, so might as well have something to do here to, to entertain them. And so that's, yeah. it's kept so me I busy. Gonna, I was going to ask you about this with the playground process. Mm -hmm. Do you have a hard time going from woodsmith tolerances to construction tolerances? Yes. Yes. That was very difficult at first. Cause it's like, normally you're jointing wood to make it flat and it's all, dry and stable and you're fitting you know pieces into you know rabbits and all the pieces are the same and so it's a lot of like okay i just gotta let it go these boards aren't gonna be all be perfect <laughs> you know it's it'll get covered up but there was um some brackets i was making right from the start that i, I cut um with a jigsaw and it was like nearly a straight smooth cut but i still took a a straight edge and flush trim bit to it. <laughs> and I'm just like, what am I doing? I, I but, would expect so, nothing less. Yeah. So it was, it's, yes, it's definitely a change from building furniture and, but it's still like measuring out where each screw is going to go. So they all like line up and look great. And, but, you know, know. And it, I'm crazy. What's, what's funny, and this is just to give our the people listening a little bit of insight into John Doyle. Okay, <laughs> when over this last summer, so the summer of uh, 2019, we moved our video studio. Right, right. we moved from a uh, the building where 
our TV show had been filmed for 12 or 13, 13 seasons uh, to a new building. And in the process of moving, we discovered that John has this weird affinity for attaching stuff to the wall with an extravagant amount of screws that are like enormously mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, yep. yeah, that three foot wall shelf, three, four screws. And then you get eight screws out and you're like, all right. John, yeah. well done. And then you have six more to take out before you get it off. <laughs> I didn't ever think those things were going to come off the wall. So. <laughs> well, right. they weren't trying to. So I can only imagine the number of screws that John is putting in this place. Yeah. At. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of money into uh, screws and hardware for sure. But <laughs> I think it I think it goes back to uh, my engineering days where it's like the first two years of college, they're like, this is what what happened to the Titanic, and this is what happened to the Challenger, and this is what happened to uh, the Bay Bridge, and it's like you're just the, it makes you afraid that something's gonna fall apart and kill someone, and <laughs> you're gonna be responsible for it. So it's like, yeah, use ten times as many screws as you need to, and so make, make sure they're all military spec and grade yep, eight yep, wear. Yeah, nice. <laughs> So. Lovely. It's so the question, session. the question is then, I guess, are your once we get back into the office, are your kids going to come to work with you just so you can have your own little cheer section every time you drive a screw? Yeah, I, okay. I think that would be great. I awesome. think I would get a lot, lot done <laughs> if they were just like always <laughs> there, like they are now. They're just yeah. always there. Yes, they are. So. Yeah, cool. perfect. So what are you guys working on? Uh, I'm still working on my router table and it's that compact router table. And I'm taking the lessons that we learned from when we built it for the TV show to heart Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and being very careful with it. So I realize Mm -hmm. that it's a pretty simple project, but it's really easy to blast through some tasks and then end up with, say wings that don't fold down all the way or Mm -hmm. parts that don't quite line up so i'm trying to uh, make sure that this one comes out right especially because like i said last time uh you know it was a bunch of pieces that we had made as stunt parts for the show Mm -hmm. and i'm gonna have to make some that need to match other parts and so that's, yeah, that's what I've what, been working on. That's a pretty yep. simple project, but there's some uh, there's some tight tolerances there, like yeah. with those piano hinge wings and the way everything kind of nests together. If you have one thing just a little crooked, ask me how I know, then the mm-hmm. wings don't fold down. Right, or, right. Or if you have one screw that's too long in the wrong place, it like screws it shut and or <laughs> right. open. Yeah, so. yeah. Huh. Just follow the plans. Yeah, and that's what I'm doing. So don't go rogue. Yeah. Well, I am going to go rogue on the fence because the original fence on that project had sliding faces, and Mm. I have a thing for dual sliding faces on a router table fence. Yeah, I know you don't like the sliding faces. So, (laughs) so I finally got this guy finished. Look at that. Oh yeah. So that is uh, our English miter plane. So this is mm-hmm. this is the first one. Um, so when we decided uh, for issue two fifty one uh, that I was going to do an English miter plane for that project, um, I I knew I wanted to make it in Bill Carter style. Okay. Uh, so I don't I don't think we talked about this before, but Bill Carter uh, is a, a English tool maker uh, in. Um, England uh, has been making planes for a number of years. Um, they're gorgeous little planes, uh, and he makes them. He started making them out of brass saw backs from old, like t- uh, back saws. saws. Yeah, tenon yeah. saws, dovetail saws, stuff like that. So they were really small, um, and he did that because that was the material he could get inexpensively when he started. So he's now transitioned into making not necessarily bigger planes. Um, but he has started, uh, he uses new stock now. So he'll use brass and bronze and stuff uh, to make them. So I knew when, uh, when we were going to do this, I wanted to make one quick um, just to kind of get the process down. And this is something sure. a lot of our builders will do and a, lot of, and a lot of us will do. We'll prototype something, right? So this was my prototype. Um, 
and I had zero expectations of this thing working. Like, I figured I'd get this thing 60% done, and then it would get tossed on the shelf and never finished because I screwed it up so bad that I just didn't want to even try to salvage it, right? <laughs> but my lord, I think mm -hmm. this thing turned out beautiful. I am so mm -hmm. happy with this thing. Uh, yeah, a little Cupid's bow on the back. Um, nice. Cupid's bow on the, on the bridge and uh, on the wedge. I, I can't say anything about it. I love it. Um, I'm afraid that this might become a little bit of an obsession for me. Because this was, <laughs> this was phenomenally fun to make. Um, and it's not complicated. It's all, uh, this was all handwork. Um, the only thing I machined on this, I used my bandsaw to basically rough out these blanks, but then I coping sawed all of these um, mm -hmm. and, hand, and hand cut them. Um, so just kind of in, in, in the spirit of Bill, um, cause that's how he does it still. Um, I wanted to see how it went and it was very, very fun to just sit there in my shop, you know, uh, maybe an hour at a time between, you know, proofreading stuff, um, and doing copy work and stuff, just working on this. Uh, and, and this took me maybe three or four days in total to make, um, but man, it works so beautifully. That mouth on there is so little and tight, and that blade's not even poking through yet. Um, mm -hmm. And it just works wonderfully well. Cool. Uh, so I got this uh, all finished up here in the last week. Um, I aged the brass, and like I said, this was my prototype. Um, so we may shoot this for the magazine. Who knows? We'll see. Um, but my next one, I'm going to make one more because I did learn some stuff on here. So I, I made a couple of mistakes. I know. Unbelievable that I made mistakes. I, I yes. know. I know. Um, what I did, the biggest mistake I made is when I laid all this out, you lay this, the body shape out on a piece of flat stock. And you basically scribe in your bed angle. You scribe in your mouth, your your um, bridge location. I didn't take into account the thickness of the iron. Mm. So what that made is it made the the area where the wedge, the iron, and the the bed um, where those all meet. It made it very very tight. So there's the uh, there's the bed in there. Mm -hmm. So it made that all very tight. Oh, okay. so my wedge my wedge here is actually very very thin. Oh, it's uh, like a shim. Yeah, and, and it works beautifully. Um, no, I have no issues with how it works. Um, it just was very hard to get everything to go together. Um, so for the one that I want to show our readers how to build, I'm going to correct some of that. And what I'm going to make this next one out of uh, is this. And this is bronze, and this stuff is mm. so cool. Um, I don't know, Phil, have we done anything in bronze? Um, no, we've always done brass because it was a little easier to find. And it um, is. The, the alloys that we usually look for with brass are something that's a free cutting. Yeah, like 260 brass. Yeah, 360, something like that, where it's, where it's not going to gum up cutting tools and stuff like that. Yeah, which is what I used on this guy because that, that's what I had. And again, this was, you know, I was completely on a, I was not expecting this thing to work like it does. Um, so Bill likes to make his out of bronze. So I would like to show this bronze. Um, sure. And it's beautiful looking. It's copper. I mean, it's a copper alloy. It's, um, it's a copper alloy. So it's very copper color. It's harder than the brass is. Um, it's a little heavier than the brass is as well. Um, but I think it'll be really fun to make it out of this. I'm super excited to try it, um, to try the bronze. And I think I'm going to probably aim for about the same size. Because this is, uh, in the world of English miter planes, this is fairly small. Um, the ones Bill makes are much smaller. His are about four inches. Um, this one's seven from heel to toe. Um, but I like this size because it, it works well on a shooting board. You know, you can throw it on its side and use it on a shooting board works very very well as a smoother um and it's not so small that it's difficult to do yeah. um i mean it's it's an overused saying but if i can do this anybody can do this i mean seriously <laughs> it's it, it's it's very very uh user friendly to to make 
Um, so I just, I was ecstatic about this, and I'm excited to start the next one. So I'll be interested to see what I do for the next infill, though, because I did this one out of pear. Uh, sure. And this is a pear tree that I took out of my grandpa's house, and it worked beautifully. I want to try something else for that one, just because I don't know that I like the the two-tone with the, the bronze as much. Um, in true Bill Carter style, I would make it out of English boxwood. But uh, English boxwood surprisingly in america is a little hard to it's hard to find and it's sure. kind of expensive um I, I reached out to uh my friend matthew out at workshop heaven and he they they carry boxwood um and we could order some from them and if people wanted to put boxwood into their miter plane they're making uh, they could do it um but it's 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 very expensive. It's not quite the price of ebony. Do you see my child walking around in the window? Yeah. Is yeah. that what you're laughing at, John? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're walking around. Hopefully they have clothes on uh, or else we're going to have to edit this video to put <laughs> take them out. Uh, but um, the, the English boxwood is, it's a super, super slow growing tree. So when you get a piece that's, you know, maybe six inches wide, that's like a 300 year old tree. Right. You know, so it's very, it's almost, it's almost the same price as ebony. And, yeah. and I don't necessarily want to imply that people have to use that. So I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll order some, maybe I won't, uh, I haven't necessarily decided yet, but uh, that has been what I've been working on and finishing up. Uh, and that is what I will be starting again soon. So cool. cool. Yeah. So I like how after I, I don't know if you guys will be able to see this, after I aged this, you can see the little tenons on the bridge, right? Oh, there. yeah, yeah. And there's one right there, too. Uh, kind of, it was funny. You couldn't see them until I aged it. And as soon as I aged it, it they popped out. It's like, oh, there they are. <laughs> so. Well, for everybody who's just listening to the uh, podcast, we do have a YouTube version of it. So you can see... Uh, Logan's playing on there and the other stuff that we've been talking about too. We'll also put some photos on the show notes page on woodsmith.com. You can find uh, under the podcast menu uh, show notes for each of the episodes. So I have a, another reader comment to wrap up this episode with. This one is a little humorous. After listening to episode 16, I must share this family story with you guys. I have a granddaughter who's 23 years old and has Crohn's disease, and anyone familiar with it knows the effects of said ailment. She lives in Michigan, and there's a shortage of TP in the area, as elsewhere. I have a daughter-in-law who lives in South Carolina. Well, said daughter-in-law purchased a case of TP and sent it to her. $20 for the case, $30 for shipping. How's that for love? Mm -hmm. Love the podcast. Keep it up. And I'm going to leave that particular viewer unnamed for this week. <laughs> so if you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks about the Shop Notes podcast, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at woodsmith at woodsmith.com. That's all we have for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this one or other ones that you've listened to, please give us a five-star rating. Not only does that uh, help us to feel better about ourselves, but it also helps the podcast get in front of more listeners. And we'd love to talk about woodworking with more and more people. So hope you'll stick around and join us next week for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects. You'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com.